Now that we have separate components for our cells and rows, it is time to assemble our very first table. Let's get right into it. So I'll first hold down an option key to place an instance of the header row component, and then I'll do the same for the body row component. Then I'll select both components and I'll hit Shift A to wrap them in a new outer layout frame. And I'll call this one simply a table. And then I'll zero out the spacing between items property. Let's give it some styling by enabling this clip content option, setting the corner radius property to uh, 8, let's say, and applying a stroke. Nice. Lastly, I will select both components inside by hitting a return key and I'll change their width to fill container. I'm doing so as I want my table along with the rows inside to adjust its content to the width I set manually. Alright, now how do we inject a custom content into this table? Remember that default content boilerplate component? We'll drag it outside, detach it, make all the edits we want, then turn it into a local component and finally we'll use it to replace that default content. This might sound complicated for now, but we'll get through each step together in a second. And the high level idea is that for each table we are going to create in the future, there will be always one local component to control its content. And so, making sure we have selected the default content component, holding down an option key, I'll drag it outside to make a new copy of it. Its, it's size might go weird at times, when, but it happens, just make sure to click reset all overrides in here. And let's detach it right away. Okay, now if you haven't already, this might be a good moment to ask yourself, what would you like your table to be about? And luckily, I already know. I would like to create a table with a list of friends that I made thanks to all the time I have saved on creating tables in a fast and fun way. <laughs> Once you made up your mind, we can start assembling cells for each row of our table. For the first cell, I have this component that's called person, which I'd like to use here. So let's just select the body cell content component and using the swap instance menu, replace it with person. Let's take a moment to appreciate just how everything adjusted itself beautifully. Because this person is a component of its own, I also get access to its properties. And this time I would like to include pictures, so let's toggle that on. For the next cell, I would like to include a different component I created previously, stars. And this is so that I can judge people I know. It's not really appropriate to judge people directly, so at least you can do it in Figma when nobody sees. Wait a second. Uh. Yep. <laughs> okay. So for this cell, however, I would like to I would like it to be only as wide as the stars component inside. So let's change its width to hat contents. All right. In the next cell, I would like to use my pill component for displaying the state in which a given friend is currently based. This time, I would like the pill component inside to have an auto width. So I'll change it to hat contents. But I'm okay with the cell itself being of a fixed width. And for the last cell, which I'll add by duplicating this one, this is going to be a phone number. So I'll select this pill inside and I'll go reset all overrides to bring back the default body cell content component. And then I'll toggle the number property on. As a last step, we'll have to decide on how wide each cell we would like to be, but also which ones should be of a fixed width and which one should be fluid. This is where our front end developer friends still have a little bit more options to play with as they can use units such as fractions, but it is not that bad for us without layout. What I tend to do the most often is basically set a maximum fixed width for all cells, except for one, which I'd like to be fluid. So let's see. The cell containing state information doesn't really need that much space, so I'm going to set it to, uh, let's say, 80 pixels. For the phone number, I can paste an example data to see how much width it might need. I have one prepared here. All right, here it is. So based on this, I can find the nearest multiply of 8, because I like multiplies of 8, like um, 128 pixels. And uh, yeah, this should do the trick. With the star cells, it is easy as we have already set it to be of a fixed width before, so we can skip it. And this leaves us with the person cell, which is going to be the one I would like to be fluid. So I'll just make sure it's set, it is still set to fill container and uh, yeah, it's all good. Great, awesome. Now that we have composed a sample row for our table, let's make it a component and I'll name it a um, uh, print row so that the name of this local component describes, describes the data it stores. Now let's go back to our row components and replace the default content boilerplate with that new local component we have just created. One thing to note is that for our header row, we'll have to replace the content of each cell back to the header cell content. So let's select everything one by one 
and then I'm going to open up the swap instance menu and I'll type in header and uh, yeah, this is the one. Lastly, let's make sure we have the right labels in our header row. And so I'll type in name and email in here, rating over there, state in here, and phone in the last cell. Oh, and by the way, this is where I would like to change the alignment to be right. Awesome, now I can duplicate this body row component a couple of times and we're done guys. This is how you can create a table using just a couple of nested components. If you'll need to create another one, simply duplicate this table along with the local component, then detach the local component and turn it back into a brand new component what that we can name, uh, let's say, um, enemies this time. <laughs> and lastly, make sure you replace the previous local components with the new one. And you can do so quickly by selecting the new table, hitting the return key two times, and using the swap instance menu to point out to our enemies row component. Now, whatever we do to our enemies, it won't affect our friends. <laughs> And if you don't want to go through the process of putting the header and body rows together in an outer layout frame over and over again, you can turn your table into a component as well. This way you will always have a base for your future edits. A base that can be safely detached, for example in case you need more rows, as everything else inside will remain connected. Okay, so let's take a step back for a second to see what we've done so far. First of all, we can resize the table however we want and the content inside will adjust and wrap if needed, like this. We can rearrange both rows of our table here, as well as columns, using our local custom component. Another thing we can do is change our rows to be selectable by selecting all of them here and changing their type to selectable. And then we can do the same thing for the header row. And lastly, we still get to control the content of all rows from one place, which lets us, for example, change this phone number to um, a simple button component. Let's just set its constraints back to hack contents and its cell alignment to right. And I'll also change its label to uh, call and let's give it an icon. And uh, I'll select an, a phone icon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how convenient is that? Remember that we haven't detached a single component and we have all these superpowers while still being able to adjust every single little detail down to inner margins of each cell. <laughs> Okay, but I'm afraid I'll have to curb my enthusiasm here for a couple of more minutes as we are heading towards the last video in this series in which we'll learn how to fill our table with data in no time or how to make it interactive, among other things as well. So I hope I will see you in the next and the last video.